Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the My Horse University and the Extensions Horse Quest live webinar titled Introduction to Environmentally Friendly Horse Management. The presenter today is Dr. Jennifer Nadeau. Jennifer is an Associate Professor and the Equine Extension Specialist for the University of Connecticut, where she has worked since 2001. Jennifer grew up riding and working with horses, including a variety of breeds and disciplines, such as trail, hunter jumpers, draft, and race horses. She also rides both English and Western. Her research focuses on equine health, while she also teaches animal nutrition for undergraduate students and works in extension outreach with adult horse owners and 4-H horse project members. Please note that you are able to ask questions during the presentation this evening via the text chat at the bottom of your screen. The questions will be answered by Dr. Christine Skelly, who is an associate professor in the Department of Animal Science here at Michigan State University. There will also be time at the end of the presentation for any additional questions that you may have. Also to let you know, this presentation is being recorded and we will be uh, uploading it to our website so you can view it at a later time if you wish to do so. And at this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Nato. Thank you very much. Um, some of the objectives of what we'll be going over today are to learn about some best management practices, describe some objectives of best management practices, and also look at management practices we can use for pasture, rivers, and streams, controlling runoff, uh, managing our manure, talk a little bit about biological control, including its pros and cons, and we'll also give you some uh, sources for further study and information on this topic. So first of all, we start with wondering um, what is a best management practice? And really that's just a proactive way that horse owners can protect the environment. And you can choose to either use one of the practices that we talk about this evening, or you might want to use a combination of practices. So it's really just whatever is comfortable for you. So the reason that we might think of doing a best management practice is, for one thing, we can help to decrease soil erosion by doing this because we'll have better pastures and better land management, which will prevent our soils from our grasses and things from being washed away and creating dirt, which would lead to mud and soil erosion. We can also protect the water quality of both our ground and surface water and preserve scenic landscapes, which will enhance our uh, relationships with our neighbors and others. The types of best management practices that we can use include pasture management, manure management, water diversions, and vegetated buffers. And we're going to talk a little bit about each of these practices. So for good pasture management, really what we want to do is either perhaps we're providing feed for our horses, which really depends on the amount of land we have available, how much we'll be able to provide nutrition. The seasons uh, can also affect that greatly depending on the area of the country that we live in. Or we might be just using our pasture for recreation, so that's going to require a little bit different type of management. But no matter what, we really want to have um, a good grass coverage to help prevent erosion, which would lead to the movement of soil and manure to water bodies. Also, we can just improve our property aesthetics, which again is going to lead to our good neighbor relations, which we always like to have. So for our pasture planning considerations, um, the first thing that we'll look at is the total number of horses that will use the pasture, how horses can be grouped per size of group, the desired length of turnout period, and the land resources available. So these are the things that we'll be considering. The horses, how the horses can be grouped is going to depend on um, whether or not the horses get along with each other, how many horses can be together, and that sort of thing. Also, the desired length of turnout period is going to depend on how long you want your horses to be able to graze, and that sort of thing. For grass needs, we need to have enough leaf area for the sunlight to reach for photosynthesis. And the rest periods um, we need to have in between to help us to maintain our roots. If we don't have enough rest, our roots are not going to be able to grow deep enough and we will not have good growth of our grasses. And we also want to allow leaves to regrow. 
We also want to have our proper soil pH and fertility. This is going to help us increase the vigor of the grass. And if the vet grass grows vigorously, it will reduce the competition from weeds. We also want to protect from um, the hooves when it's wet out or other vulnerable times. Like right now in the Northeast, uh, we have some snow. And if we have pounding through the snow as there's melting, then we're going to have uh, damage from the hoofs, which is going to eventually damage our grasses. So using pasture as forage, we would want to keep our horses, we would want to have them have 1.5% of their body weight per day through either consuming hay or access to pasture. Now that's a little higher than um, most horse specialists will recommend. They'll usually say around 1%, but um, from the horses that I've seen around here, they a lot of them maybe have a little more grain than they really need. So I recommend feeding as much um, hay or pasture as you can. Um, and then depending on your performance needs, you may have to feed um, more concentrates to um, have enough energy for your needs. So this is really um, at 1.5% of body weight per day for a thousand pound horse, you're looking at a minimum of 15 pounds of roughage per day. Horses can usually eat about 1 to 1.4 pounds per hour on pasture. They've actually studied that. And um, mature horses really need coarse forage for healthy digestive systems, so they have to be able to consume hay or pasture to get that. So if you want to think about the percent of ration that should be foraged for a maintenance horse, notice that it could be up to 100% of their ration in forage. And so that's if you have a pasture pet or a horse that's just um, out there. And then for work, you have you have the light horse at getting 80 to 60 percent and a heavy horse 50 to 25 percent of, of rations. And then for our pasture as the only forage, we can use a fat and fiber supplement recommended, and we must have additional phosphorus, selenium, zinc, copper, and vitamin A. So how do I tell what grass I have? Here we need to see seed heads um, in order to tell exactly what there is. I'm just checking to see if you can all hear what I'm saying because I want to make sure that you guys are able to hear. Um, some people are saying that they're having trouble seeing, hearing, so if you could just quickly type in your text chat and let us know that you can hear, that would be good. Okay, good. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so how do I tell what grass I have? We're going to look at the seed heads, and we can go to books and websites to identify um, whether or not our grasses are what we think they are. Another way of knowing is if we have been um, planting our grasses um, and we know what pasture mix we use, then we would, of course, know what grass we have. But really, it takes um, a mature grass to be able to identify it, and it's actually really hard. I mean, a lot of people will ask us if we could come out and look at their grass and tell them what it is. But unless it's fairly mature, it is really difficult to tell exactly what kind of grass they have. I mean, there might be four or five different types that grow in the area, but it's going to be difficult to tell without um, having the seed heads to be able to compare, or even the roots uh, is another way that we can look at it. So these are some different um, books and websites that can aid in identification. And there's a great plant image gallery online as well that I'll direct you to. So this is some ways, if you are wondering what pasture you have, to find out. The next thing people often want to know is how do I know how much fertilizer to apply? You've probably heard of how it's difficult to, um, you don't want to put too much fertilizer on your pastures because you're, you're worried that you, know, you might have runoff and might cause um, phosphorus and things to leach into the soil. So here you need to get a soil test. Um, and you can either get this from your cooperative extension service at your land grant university, or you can get it from a feed or supply store. Um, or even, this is kind of a, a thing that you um, might not know, but if you um, 
just check with your local place where you're getting feed, you can go ahead and get your soil test on there and send it in. And it's actually very simple to do a soil test. You would go out and take several different um, samples from your pasture. You want to use the areas that are more bare in a separate uh, test than where grass is growing well, and that will, they'll be able to then diagnose problems with those bare spots and let you know what you need to apply. Next, uh, the question is, what do I do about invasive plants? Because we do get a lot of invasive plants that can invade our pastures and really take over. Uh, here we have a problem with um, multiflora rose, which can get really out of control. So we can use a broadleaf weed killer like 2,4-D, also called Weed Be Gone, um, before we clip our pasture. And w or we can remove our weeds before our seed heads mature. And um, one thing about Roundup that some people may like to use is that Roundup may cause colic in horses. So we want to be cautious about using that and then having the horses out. So what we should do if we're worried about our weed killers, even if we read the label and it says okay, we should just let it rain after the use and then it's okay to put the horses out. Again, we should read our labels all the time to make sure that this is true. And I've also found that if you call them and uh, talk to the manufacturer and tell them that you need tech support and you ask them if that is safe for livestock, they will be able to tell you if it's safe for horses or not. Then wondering also how to maintain your pastures well. Many grasses um, need two to six weeks rest period to regrow roots and shoots, which sounds like a fairly long um, period of time. Most grasses uh, do need to rest when they're down to one and a half to two inches high. So you might want to consider um, some kind of fencing that you could use where you could use smaller areas and then let your pastures rest. So this would be a, like a rotational grazing system. Um, and also with this, you could um, use even temporary fencing and move your horses to different segments of the pasture. And you want to remove, take this opportunity when you're resting your pasture to remove the manure or drag the manure um, before the rest period. People always wonder about parasite eggs and things like that, but if we're um, taking away the manure or dragging it, if we drag it, we're exposing it to the sun and those parasite eggs are going to heat up and break down and we're not going to have to worry about the parasites. They'll be killed by the high temperatures. So that will work out fine. We can also we should clip our pastures before the rest periods. What will happen when we clip it is we'll have um, uniform regrowth. So this will help us by removing the mature grass and letting all the grass that comes up be sweet and tender like the horses like to eat. Again, we can remove the weeds before the seed heads mature. Another idea is if we have steep or rocky land where mowing would be difficult for you to add some livestock, maybe some sheep, Maybe you could even borrow some from your neighbor, um, or they sometimes uh, little ponies. Um, they have some around here that they'll bring in, and they can um, help where mowing is difficult. So rotational grazing, we've kind of touched on just a little bit already, but this is a system of dividing pastures so that grass can rest when it is only one and a half to two inches high. Again, we can use this portable or temporary fencing or create a system of paddocks. And we want to take the horses off when the grass is too low, and we want to put them back on the pasture when it regrows to six to eight inches. So again, this is just giving your roots and shoots a chance to regrow. We only um, need four inches high for Kentucky bluegrass and white clover. They're a little more hardy than the other grass species. And your grass species is really going to depend on what part of the country you're from, what the recommendations are. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Sacrifice areas. A selected area is sacrificed from the grazing system. It's not a grizzly thing like it might sound a sacrifice area, but it's going to be used to confine animals in order to protect pastures from overuse at the critical times. These would be times when we have heavy rain, anything that's going to churn up the um, grasses from the horse's hooves. So we need to have a minimal size. We need to create a good surface. And we need to, we will want to have it close to the barn, but we'll also want to have it away from water bodies and runoff. This will help us with convenience. And then we should undertake daily manure removal because that will help keep the sacrifice area in great condition um, and able to be maintained. So you should almost treat it like a stall where you would remove the manure daily for best um, management. So the benefits of a well-planned sacrifice area would be that you'll have a hoof-friendly surface for better horse health. 
can also reduce mud, which is always a happy thing uh, for us here. We don't like mud and we don't like ice. So it'll help to reduce both of those because you won't have ponding of water because you won't have, you'll have a level surface area. You'll also have an ease of manure removal and management. You'll have improved aesthetics and you can reduce manure or soil laden runoff to water bodies. So you can keep this soil from washing away by having a nice surface that's well maintained. Can also reduce the fly breeding habitat and we can improve our pastures because we're going to use the sacrifice area as a management tool to put the horses on when it would be hazardous to put them on our pasture. And the thing to keep in mind too about our sacrifice area is here we're going to want to we're going to have to do some work probably depending on our area, but we'll have to remove this topsoil, put a nice layer of um, of gravel in and then have a nice um, stone dust or sand surface which makes a very nice um, sacrifice area. Next is um, should I receive my pastures? So the fact is if you have nothing but weeds and bare soil then yes this would be a good time to reseed your pasture but if there's grass present then you want to try to use some of the other tips that we've talked about, like rotating your pastures, resting the pasture, testing the soil pH and fertility, and adjusting it as needed. Because otherwise, you might wipe out your entire uh, grass surface and have nothing left, and it might take a while to regrow. I mean, just because you follow the planting directions, if it's a bad season, you may not get a good grass um, layer coming back. The grass may not, you know, respond to what you've done, and then you might be out you know, with no grass for a while. So you only want to reseed if, you know, you could do patch seeding, but you don't want to renovate, tear up everything unless it's just really bad. Next we have when do I plant new grass. Now that's going to really depend on your area of the country, so you should check with your cooperative extension service. Yeah, it's probably going to be in the spring or fall when the most um, raining uh, will occur. So that's really going to depend um, on when we have rain and maybe need a crystal ball to try to figure out too when it's going to be best to plant. This fall we had a lot of rain so it would have been really good but it doesn't always work that way. So the thing about fall too when you do a fall planting is that you may um, by then, if you, if you do your renovation in the fall and your grass is coming up, you might be able to use it in spring whereas if you do out for a while um, without having grasses available. So you have to consider how long you want to not have your grass. So that's something to think about. Um, ideas to improve your pasture management. So again, you can put in a sacrifice area like we've talked about. You could improve the footing of the current sacrifice area that you have. Uh, find a way to divert water away from your sacrifice area. Sometimes um, we have drainage issues and our sacrifice area has water going on to it which is defeating the purpose of the sacrifice area because that ends up being a muddy mess. We also want to create or refine our rotational grazing system. That would be an easy way to improve our pasture management even by use of temporary fencing. Clipping the field, something fairly easy to do with a mower going out and mowing. Um, soil testing and fertilizing only as needed so that we don't add to um, the phosphorus and other levels of nutrients that aren't needed in the soil, only providing what is needed. Next we have stream crossings. It's a rather extreme one that I show in the picture. You'd be amazed how hard it is sometimes to find these even though I'm at farms and sometimes forget to take pictures. But this is really just a way for horses to get across the stream without causing erosion or stream contamination. It's kind of ironic because in the old days we used to want to have water on the farms so that we didn't need to carry water across, um, across the uh, the property so we wanted to have water right out in the pasture but then now we try to avoid water so that we don't pollute the streams so it's a little bit different than the things that we used to think of. So we really need to consider the characteristics of the stream, the location of the stream, its purpose, the amount of traffic on the stream, maybe there's <laughs> even boats going through, things like that, the longevity of the stream and its cost to put in a water a stream crossing and the design of the stream crossing that we should use. And we can use a culvert or we can use a bridge to have the water go through. And we probably really will need to consult an engineer if we're going to create a water crossing because it's, as you see there's a variety of things that are involved in it. Next we have river and stream bank management. Um, and 
people wonder, what is a vegetated buffer? Now this is placed between your horse keeping activities and water courses, and it's going to create some distance to prevent pollutants from going into sensitive areas. You would vegetate them either with dense grass, which will work very well, shrubs and trees can help absorb a lot of the nutrients, and they also slow the flow of water. We can also, the benefits of the vegetated buffers are that they will reduce the risk of injury due to mud and ice. We won't have mud and ice along the streams, so therefore um, we won't have erosion and we won't have nutrients washing into the stream and our horses won't be injured. We'll have fewer lost shoes because there'll be no mud sucking the shoes off and we'll also improve the look of our property. Instead of having erosion down to our stream, it'll be a nice vegetated buffer. And how they act is that they slow runoff to water courses. They help absorb the nutrients that would normally end up in the surface water, and they trap sediments and solids that are carried in the runoff. And these really help to stabilize the stream banks and shorelines. They also provide shade for fish, so if any of you fishermen are out there, then the vegetated buffer will be a benefit to you because it'll keep water temperatures cool and oxygen levels high, and really provides food and habitat for wildlife and organisms that fish feed on, so maybe you'll be able to catch a few more this time. And how do I make one? Um, basically, you want to determine what the desired width is. Um, the ideal is 200 feet from sensitive areas, but we find that a lot of people just really can't do that. So we recommend at least 35 feet at a minimum. Um, so you can install or move existing fences to keep the horses out of that area and provide water for the horses if needed if the stream was the source of water. Then you want to plant the grasses, or you can improve those present to get a dense growth. And you know, you want to consider here using the native grasses, because those are really going to do well, and it's along the stream, and it's going to, and it's going to do a good job. We can mow twice a year to help keep the grass dense and reduce the weeds. And if possible, we want to allow a strip of shrubs, trees, and grasses to be established. And what we can do to improve your river and stream bank management, these are some easy ways to improve it, we can keep horses out of the water bodies through fencing and create a vegetated buffer. Next we have water diversions. A diversion is really just a way to redirect water around an area of concern and outlet it to a stable, suitable site. This will help to keep the clean water clean and it helps to reduce erosion and mud because the water is revert, diverted away from areas of concern where mud could be created or things could be washed away. There's two types of water diversions. There's the diversion ditch or swale, which we see in the top picture, or a roof gutter, as we see in the bottom picture. And the diversion ditch or swale must be prepared to handle the predicted quantity of water. And what you do is you construct this ditch across a slope to intercept the runoff and then redirect or divert it to another location. And you want to size and stabilize it depending on the velocity of the water that will be coming through, so how fast the water will be coming through, the soil type, and the slope. Again, that's something where you might want to consult with like an engineer or someone from the Natural Resources Conservation Service who would be likely to be able to help you um, to construct that to the best uh, specifications that are going to work for your particular location. Next, we have a roof gutter. And here we discharge our roof gutters through downspouts, which was something I learned when I bought a house, that you have to have downspout extenders um, to help once you go through the downspout, if you still need to outlet it away from an area of erosion, you would get a downspout extender that could do that. Or we can divert it to a dry well or an underground pipe. So these are other ways that we could do that, and so we'll divert it away from our areas of horse keeping. So if we want to decrease soil erosion and manage our runoff, if the horses are on pasture full time, we ne might need more than two acres per horse, or we're going to have to have really good management of our area to decrease soil erosion. We also want to avoid wet soils, and we want to use a sacrifice area. These would be, again, well-drained, have no organic matter, so we're picking up the manure daily, and of a minimal size so that you're not sacrificing too much of your land to bare ground where you might have hopefully no erosion from the good maintenance that you'll be using though. 
and then we'll look at decreasing the pollution of water bodies. Again, if we um, create vegetative buffers along streams and we divert um, polluted runoff from sacrificed lots toward level pastures and away from wells and surface water, then we can avoid um, polluting our water bodies. And another thing is to spread the manure on pastures in fall. I saw that one of you was asking about um, spreading the manure in the winter, and we really don't recommend spreading the manure when the ground is frozen because that can create a situation for runoff. So it's best to just sort of stockpile and cover your manure in the winter and then spread it again in spring once things have thawed out so that the um, grasses can absorb the nutrients because in the winter it's just frozen, the ground is frozen, and no nutrient absorption is occurring, so it's just all going into runoff. We also want to use a soil test before applying nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, or calcium. Um, so that we know exactly what our land needs and we're only applying the nutrients that are needed. That will decrease pollution to the water bodies because extra nutrients won't be running off and going into the water bodies. We also could keep our animal density at less than one and a half horses per acre. I'm not really sure what a half a horse is, maybe that's a pony, but we want to prevent excessive phosphorus levels in the soil if we're using pasture year round. And then we want to apply limestone to maintain our soil pH at greater than 6 because that's best for our grasses. But again, by doing a soil test, we'll know exactly what nutrients we're going to need, and that will also tell us what we need to do for our soil pH. Manure management, one of the first considerations is location. We want to ensure that our manure is located an adequate distance away from any water that might run off and carry away nutrients. We want to keep it away from slopes. We want to keep it away from water bodies. We want to keep it away from your well, because you don't want to be drinking anything that might have had manure in it. And then away from property lines, because that's really going to work best for your neighbors. And there may even be local zoning ornaments, uh, ordinances sorry, for minimum setbacks. So you'll want to check on that with your town or your county or whoever the governing agency for your um, residence or operation is. One of the simplest things for manure management is really just to cover it. If we cover the manure pile, either as simply as using a tarp or as more complicated as creating a roof structure, that is really going to help a lot. It's going to help to reduce fly breeding. It's also going to help speed up the decomposition of the manure, and it'll reduce the volume of the manure on the property. So you could put a tarp with some tires or maybe some bricks or blocks on it. Some people say it's inconvenient to lift the tarp and then put it on, but I mean, you could lift it during the time that you're cleaning stalls and then cover it back up again. This keeps the rainwater from washing the manure from the pile and contaminating clean areas as well if we cover the manure. The size. We want to make sure that the storage area is big enough for the time period that you're going to need to store it. So to calculate that, you can measure your average daily waste, the amount of manure and bedding that you take out of the stall, and then you can multiply by that by the number of days between the plan removal for composting, disposal, or utilization of the manure. Some storage options include covered dumpsters, which are really great. You can contract with a company that will come and pick up the covered dumpster and take it away, of course, for a fee. You can have a three-walled structure with a roof or tarp cover. I've seen some pretty fancy ones that are really nice here in Connecticut. Uh, you could have a covered compost pile. Again, you could cover it with something as simple as a tarp, or you can use a bin system like we see in the picture. You can even use a covered or enclosed truck bed or manure spreader. Um, and trash cans with lids if you have a very small operation, maybe like one or two horses. So what do we do with it all? That's the main question, right? So the first thing is we could have a sanitation company haul it away, like we talked about with the dumpsters or um, some other arrangement. We could have a local farmer or landscaper remove it or bring it to them. Um, we could give it to friends, families, and neighbors for a landscaping. Um, there are some places in Connecticut that formed a manure cooperative, um, and it was a landscaper who had an, a piece of land, and people would bring their manure to him, and he would um, compost it and then use it in his landscaping operation. Of course, he did charge a fee. A lot of people want to get money for their manure, 
but sometimes it's good just to get rid of it. So even if we have to pay to get rid of it, maybe it's worth it just not to have it build up. I don't know if that's one of the hard things. Or if one of you out there could just figure out a way to channel that manure into energy. I've heard of some people doing that with dairy manure. I figure we could run our towns easily on a manure cooperative. So that's something to think about. Again, composting, you could use it in your own area for landscaping. Give it to your friends and your family. Some benefits of composting, it kills the parasites and weed seeds in the waste. It will improve the soil quality if applied to fields. And it does not cause nitrogen depletion that gets caused when uncomposted horse waste is spread. So by doing that, you will not deplete the nitrogen from the plants. And it contains plant nutrients that help plants grow. So we could have pretty flowers, nice vegetables, and things like that. One, uh, some basics about composting, and I know that there's going to be a talk later on manure management, so I won't take all their fire, but it needs oxygen. So you can either have an active pile in which you're actively turning the pile, or a passive pile, and in a passive pile you can even put a um, perforated PVC pipe, which will let oxygen into the pile. You put that on the bottom of the pile. Someone once asked me if it's, it's put in like a chimney. No, it's uh, laid flat at the bottom of the pile and then you put your manure over it. And you want to maintain the temperature of the pile at 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So you could use a garden thermometer, which you could get at any gardening store or um, nursery, um, and you want to maintain at 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So if it goes below 110 or over 140, it's time to turn the pile if you're doing the active turning. The minimum size of a pile would be 4x4x4 four by four by four for best results. Again, you can use a three-bin system, which you see on the bottom, or windrows, which are those long, thin piles that you see on the top. And the manure should be as moist as a wrung-out sponge, so that gives you an idea of how moist it should be. You can cover the manure or add water as needed. The carbon to nitrogen ratio should be 20 to 1 to 40 to 1, and straight horse manure is about 25 to 30 to 1. Um, so the only problem is when we get a lot of bedding in, like our shavings and our sawdust, then we're adding more carbon. We want to locate our manure again away from runoff and water bodies. Then you want to cover your manure with a tarp, and you want to buy a small uh, some ideas to improve your manure management would be to cover your manure with a tarp. So that's the simplest one, really, that probably just about any of us could do. Um, at one of my talks, they were giving out tarps, which was really great. Um, then we, can, we could buy a small manure spreader. That's another way we could improve our manure management so we'll be able to spread our manure. We could build a portable structure over the manure. Move the manure further away from a water body or well, which we should probably really do anyway. Um, also, divert the water away from your manure storage area, maybe by creating a diversion ditch or swale, some idea like that. And give a hand, try a hand at composting, because you'll find that you'll have a usable product at the end, which they call black gold. Now, this is um, a rather elaborate scheme of biological control by Rubin, um, but we're not going to have to go to any of these kind of measures to create our biological control. Um, the one thing we wonder is, what do flies need to complete their life cycles? So the flies really need appropriate breeding materials. So that means organic matter. They also need optimum moisture and adequate warmth. If we eliminate one, then we can prevent fly breeding. And with an integrated fly control problem, will a program, sorry, will include our general farm sanitation. So those things that we were already talking about are manure management, organic waste management, and even including weed control. Also moisture control, so we don't have a moist area for the insects to breed. Judicious use of insecticides, and mechanical and biological control. Mechanical being uh, ways that we can control them, like fly swatters and things like that, fly tapes, and biological control of being with fly predators and parasites. So biological control is the reduction of pest populations by natural enemies, and it typically involves an active human role because we have to get involved to bring these natural enemies in. Our biological control agents can include predators, parasitoids, or pathogens. A successful natural enemy will have a high reproductive rate, it'll have good searching ability, it'll have host specificity, so it'll be able to 
um, find its host, which would be the flies that are bugging you. And then it'll have adaptability to environmental conditions. And it'll be synchronized with its host or pest. It'll also have health and robustness. It'll have pre-adaptation, general mobility, and it will persist even at low prey density. So even when there aren't a lot of flies, the natural enemies will persist. But don't worry, they won't bother you. Predators, parasitoids, and pathogens are things that we talk about. Predators are mainly free living species and they consume a large number of prey during their lifetime. These, for example, are lacewing and lady beetles. Parasitoids are those species whose immature stage develops on or within a single insect host, ultimately killing the host. An example is many species of wasps and some flies are parasitoids. Pathogens are those disease-causing organisms, including bacteria, fungi, and viruses that kill or debilitate the host and are relatively specific to certain insect groups. So they're going to cause uh, damage to the host and cause it to die. So some horse insect pests, we think mainly of the house fly and the stable fly, and this gives you an idea of their life cycle in which there's an egg, then there's a larva, might be different stages of larvae, then the pupa, then the fly. The house and stable flies can be controlled by parasitoids. So these are your parasitic wasps. And these are some different kinds that you can see there, the spelangias and the mucidifurax um, furaxes, which are other types of parasitic wasps. So the pa and then there's a pathogen that we can use in controlling mosquitoes, which is legini Oh, I cannot talk today. Legenia, Leneg well, we'll just leave that one out. Legen Legenian, Le <laughs> forget about it. Um, so we'll make it, it gets very complicated trying to say them. Um, but that pathogen uh, can be used to control mosquitoes. And then a future pathogen for use in controlling worms in horses is also on your screen, uh, Duntonia flagrant, and we can use that to control worms in horses. The pros of biological control is that it's long-term, it's relatively inexpensive, it's target-specific, and it's environmentally friendly, so we don't have to use any pesticides or things like that. The cons of biological control are that it can be slow to act, because it's going to take a little while for the parasites, uh, parasitoids to develop. It might be less effective, depending on um, the situation. It may have potential non-target effects. Usually doesn't affect people, though. Uh, requires appropriate timing and requires the release of the correct number of enemies. So for most places where you're buying these um, biological controls, you'll need to follow their directions exactly or it won't be effective. So basically what will happen is you'll order your parasitoids, they'll be shipped as parasitized, uh, parasitized pupae in sawdust, and then you'll place a small handful on hot spots, like your roughs in the pasture, near some water troughs, and things like that. You'll dig a half inch hole in the ground, you'll drop in a small handful of the sawdust and pupae, then you'll cover it over with straw, manure, or earth, and that will help you protect them against the wind, birds, or insecticides so that they don't get eaten up before they can do their work. They will then travel 30 to 50 meters in search of viable larvae and pupae once they develop. And when do you use them? Really, you have to think to yourself, are house flies and stable flies my major problems? Because if they're not, then it's not going to be effective. You also have to look at your own waste management plan. Are you picking up manure every day? Are you cleaning your pastures? Are you removing manure? These are the things you have to consider because it's not going to work if you don't also have an effective waste management program. Then you have to look at can you get the right types of wasps, which you probably will be able to. They're available um, online now, which is very convenient. And you'll have to see if they're affordable for you. You'll have to look at the right time of year. Um, in Connecticut, these are the dates that we would use. And how much would this cost? It really varies depending on the company and the number of horses that you have. For one horse, it can be around $150 um, and up to 20 horses. It's around $400 per shipment. The estimates of success vary, although I've ha heard a lot of anecdotal evidence from people um, in Connecticut. They say the first year you don't see a huge difference, but the second and third, fourth year, you notice a huge difference in the reduction of flies. Um, 
these uh, researchers estimated the level of partial success to be about 14 percent, fully successful 5.5 percent. Um, but two independent test studies by the USDA completely suppressed a population of house flies within 30 days and eliminated stable flies at a poultry house after 98 days. So that's pretty solid evidence. And then there was a 93 percent reduction in the population of common biting stable flies um, from a multi-year study at the University of California. And Debach and Rosen estimated the level of po partial success to be at about 40 percent for 416 insect species and fully successful for 75 of those species. So biological control agents can be effective against house and stable flies when used properly. They are cost effective, but again, you do need to use them with other methods like waste management, weed control, moisture control, and mechanical control. And then more studies really are being done with emerging information in the area of using pathogens, not just parasitoids, on horse tests. These are some websites um, that might be of interest to you. Um, I know that Chris already mentioned the e-extension website. Um, and then this is a one that we have, the top one is one from Connecticut, the Horse Environmental Awareness Program, which has a lot of fact sheets on things like um, sacrifice areas and um, pasture management and things like that. And Future webcasts will include on February 10th, Horse Manure Management by Dr. Ann Swinker, and March 10th, uh, Horse Pasture Management by Dr. David Freeman. These are some of the sources that I used, so these might be of use to you as well. And uh, then I just wanted to mention some upcoming events that we have at UConn, the Connecticut Horse Symposium. That's a combination of lectures and demonstrations on horse-related topics coming up on March 21st and 22nd, 2009 here at UConn. And you can go to this link to see what we're going to have there. Um, we also have a Sigma Alpha Open Horse Show on April 18th here. Um, a draft horse plow match. We've just set the date for April 25th. Just got that date today. 4-H uh, Mounted Clinic on April 18th. Our Hippology contest on April 25th is going to be a busy day. Our horse auction also on that day. And then the following day, a horse judging contest. And for those that have riding camps, a, a riding camp safety certification clinic on June 6th. Um, and then if you have questions about this and other horse-related topics, then you could email me at jennifer.nato at uconn.edu or ask your questions um, online. And th that's my website. And I guess we're ready to take any questions. Hope I didn't go too fast for you guys. So note that the pasture webcast will be in February and the manure webcast in March. I'm sorry about that. Uh, the link that you would give would be the myhorseuniversity.com. I think she's going to be typing that right now.
Once again, just want to remind everyone that we do have a few minutes here for some more questions. Uh, so if you do have some questions, go ahead and just type it in the bottom of the screen of the text chat. And uh, we've got Jennifer here yet to um, answer any questions that you may have. We still do have a few minutes to, uh, for some questions for Jennifer, uh, but I would like to take a moment and thank Dr. Nato for this great presentation this evening, and I'd also like to thank each and every one of you for participating as well. Just to let you know, our next webcast will be Tuesday, February 10 at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, and the topic will be Pasture Management for Horse Acreages. This webcast is the second in the three-part series we're offering on environmental issues in the horse industry. And it will be presented by Dr. Dave Freeman, who is from Oklahoma State University. For more information, just visit our website at www.myhorseuniversity.com. And you can send us any comments or suggestions to info at myhorseuniversity.com as well. Uh, we did also have a question on uh, the recording of this presentation this evening. Uh, the rec this is being recorded and we will be uploading the recording to the website uh, Thursday of this week. And you can actually view any of our um, archived webcasts as well on our website. So there are a variety of topics to choose from. So once again, uh, thank you and I hope you all have a great evening. And once again, if you still have some questions, uh, feel free to continue um, asking them on the chat right here. Have a great evening.